So to organize our thinking, I find in these types of bound state problems that it always pays off really to solve this in sequence from left to right. So let's start on the left-hand side. So in, on the left-hand side, that's region 1. And for region 1, then, I'm going to have a solution, which I will call phi sub 1. And this, of course, applies only for x less than minus a. And in this region, right, it's a forbidden region, so I have then exponential type solutions. I could use growing and shrinking exponentials, or I could use the cinch and the cosh type solutions. But I know I have a very special boundary condition that has to apply as I go out far back here towards infinity. Right? I know that what I want my solution to look like is something that's going to be decaying away. It always has to curve away from my axis, right? but it can't blow up on me. So I know it's going to be some kind of an exponential function out here. So it's going to be most convenient for applying the boundary condition which is relevant as I head towards infinity. It will be most uh, convenient to express things in terms of growing and shrinking exponentials. So going with that then, I would write this in the exponential form. So I'm going to have a constant c1 times e to the First, I had the positive solution, alpha. Actually, I had written this, I'm sorry, as minus alpha is what I usually put with my C, although you could do it either way you want, e to the minus alpha x. And you might want to leave a little bit of space up here in your notes. I'm going to make a comment. That's the decaying exponential. And then, of course, I would have d1 times the growing exponential, a plus alpha x. Now, the first fine point I want to point out is that we have boundary conditions for the solution in this region, not only towards minus infinity, but also we have to match boundary conditions at the point x equals minus a. We've chosen the exponentials to help match the boundary condition towards minus infinity, anticipating then that we have also boundary conditions at x equals minus a. It behooves us, it will make our algebra much, much simpler if we choose to center these solutions at that boundary point. So the way we center at a given location is by subtracting its location, and the location here which we are, uh, at which we are matching is x equals minus a, so I would subtract off minus a. So I'm going to write my solution in that form, and you will notice, of course, I get two minus signs, so this just becomes x plus a, and I will do the same thing for my other term. Now I'm ready to think about my boundary conditions. First, let's think about what goes on as we head towards negative infinity. I want to make sure when I stick x equals negative infinity into this solution that I don't have any exponential growth. I can't tolerate any function that would blow up on me. Now if x goes to minus infinity, notice this term would give me minus minus infinity, would give me the exponential of a positive infinite number. This would blow up toward infinity very quickly. So we can eliminate this first term based on what we had previously called boundary condition number one, that we can't have any exponential growth as we go off toward infinity. The next parameter, so this is my solution. The parameter d1, I'm going to leave as undetermined for now, but we should realize this is just going to be the overall normalization constant in our solution. So this will just be the overall normalization, right? Which isn't particularly relevant, and we can always divide by it later when we want to produce a properly normalized wave function. We will just carry it along with us, but recognizing that we need some kind of normalization constant, this then actually completes my solution for uh, the function phi 1 of x. So let me just put a little box around my final result. Very good. So that was region 1. Next, we contend with region 2. So over here in region 2, and I'll just remind you, I'm making a little sketch of what my phi of x looks like as I solve along from region to region. In region 2, I have this other solution, right, phi 2, which applies for x between minus a and plus a. 
And in this region too, as we had pointed out, what we have is curvature towards the axes. We have my sine and cosine, my oscillatory type solutions. And these I can write as sines and cosines, or I could also write them as forward and backward traveling waves with complex exponentials. So we have to make sort of a design choice here in our algebra. You can choose any representation you want, just some will make the math a lot easier than others. Now if we think a little bit about what would be most convenient, let's anticipate what we will be doing next. So we are going to write down some kind of oscillatory solution in this region, but the, one of the first things we're going to do, because we are solving from left to right, is we are going to attach it at this point, matching this value and slope of my wave function at the point x equals minus a. And by far, always, the most convenient form for matching slope and value type boundary conditions are the sine and cosine for an oscillatory region or the cosh and the cinch for an exponential type region. The reason for that is that sine and cosine have very simple values when written down centered appropriately at the corresponding boundary. So we're going to go with the sine and cosine form. So we will have then A2, because I'm in region 2, times cosine of K, not K2, because I only have a single K to worry about, which I've defined over here, times X. But as I've just said, I know I want to match boundary conditions at X equals minus A. So it's going to be best to write this as cosine of X plus A, plus then B2 times sine of K, again times X plus A. Once again, just to uh, uh, drive the point home, if I, I could write this form, uh, there's an alternate form with just cosine kx and sine kx. I can convert between the two of them, as you can see, by doing some trig identities. It's just that, uh, and you will come to the same answers in the end, but as we are about to see, the algebra for this uh, form is much, much simpler. So we're going to stick with this. Very good. So I know what my form looks like. My job, as I just said, is to match the slope and value boundary conditions at that point. So we're going to be applying now boundary condition number two, which has two parts to it. And we're going to be applying it at uh, location x equals minus a. That's my attachment point to my solution I had in region one. And those boundary conditions say both the value and the slope have to be continuous. So let's look at the value. So the value of my wave function, I'm going to write the condition over here so I don't run out of space, right? The, by matching the value, what I'm saying is that when I take phi 2 and I evaluate it at x equals minus a, it must match phi 1 at exactly that same location, at x equals minus minus a, right? All I'm saying is that when I take my solution that applies in region 2 and I evaluate it at this point, it must match the value, it must attach with the same value here with which uh, phi 1 is when it is evaluated at x equals minus a. Now here comes the mathematics, and this is why this, these forms I've chosen are so convenient. When I look at phi 2 and I s insert x equals minus a, when I look at the sine term, I get sine of 0. But sine of 0 is just 0. So this whole term is no longer relevant. And I just get a2 times the cosine. And the cosine, though, when x equals minus a, when I evaluate at that particular point, gives me cosine of 0. But as we know, cosine of 0 is just 1. So as soon as I write down the rest of this equation, I will immediately know my unknown constant a2. So let's look at the other side of the equation. I have to evaluate phi 1 at the location x equals minus a. When I look at phi 1, here he is. When I stick in x equals minus a, I just get e to the 0. So I'll get d times e to the 0. And what's beautiful about that, I have d1 times e to the 0, is that e to the 0 is a very simple quantity. It also is just 1. So I've immediately learned that a2 is just my normalization constant d1, the simplest type of equation I would have to solve. So that now I know a2. So I'm hoping my second boundary condition will tell me b2. So the uh, 
Second boundary condition at that point is the slopes. Those also must be equal. So I now am going to be equating phi 2 prime evaluated at minus a, right? I don't need the reminder. You know it's x that's being set to minus a. Also must match phi 1 prime at minus a. And now let's evaluate these. So phi 2 prime. When I take the derivative of this, cosine will turn into sine. But when I have the sine function and I stick in minus a, I will get sine of 0 is 0, and this term will drop out. So I will only have this term remaining. When I take the derivative of this with respect to x and evaluate at minus a, I will get k times b2, k times b2, times cosine of kx plus a. But x plus a will be 0, and cosine of 0, we've already been discussing this, is 1. So I just get the k times the b2 as I've written down. Very simple and straightforward. Finally, notice I can solve for b2, my last remaining unknown, very easily as soon as I write down the left-hand side of this equation. So let's go to that. So phi prime 1 at minus a, here's phi 1. When I take the derivative of this, I pull down an alpha, which will multiply the d1, which was just my normalization constant. I will then have my exponential, but when I stick in x equals minus a, I will get e to the 0, which is once again just 1, so times 1. And now you can see I have immediate access to b2, which is just alpha over k times d1. In fact, it's kind of silly to write down that 1. Let's just call it alpha d1. Great. So this means then I have my final solution for phi 2 of x. I can just uh, extract and write down immediately. It equals a2 times cosine. a2, we learned, was just that normalization constant, d1. So I get d1 times cosine of k times x plus a plus, now, b2 is this quantity. So it again has this factor of d1 entering in which then would multiply alpha divided by k, so times alpha divided by k. And then what b2 is multiplying is the sine function. So then I would have times sine of k uh, times x plus a, and that is my solution for phi 2. I can put a nice box around that. Now one quick comment on this before I get to phi 3. I just would like for you to notice that phi 1 is directly proportional to the overall normalization. And just as we had anticipated, phi 2 also is just has this overall factor of d1. So it really is just acting as an overall normalization constant. Great. So I've now solved for phi 2. If I go back to my sketch so I can track my progress, I'm now here in region 2. I've attached things properly. Here I have a curvature toward my axis, so my solution might look something like so as it comes across. And now you see the next thing that I will have to do is attach this solution to uh, my solution in region 3. So let's go on now to region 3 and try to understand how it uh, fits together with the rest here of my wave function. Region 3. So I have phi 3, which applies only for x greater than a. And in this region, what I'm expecting is, once again, I'm in a forbidden region. And being in a forbidden region out here, I'm expecting exponential behavior curving always away from my axis with the characteristic constant alpha. Now, once again, I've got choices. I could use cinch and cosh functions, hyperbolic uh, sine and cosine. Those are going to be very convenient for actually attaching the appropriate slope and value over here. That would give me my boundary condition at x equals plus a. I also will have a boundary condition as x goes to infinity, which I need to think about. We haven't got there yet, but I'm trying to be very consistent here. I'm going to be solving from left to right. So in choosing my form, I know the exponentials will be useful for imposing the boundary condition at infinity, but if I want to attach at this point x equals plus a, my best choice is the cinch and cosh. 
So we're going to uh, take that approach, and we will worry later about the boundary condition at infinity because we're going from left to right is the most organized way to go. So I'm going to say I have sine and cosine type solutions again, but this is the hyperbolic location because I'm in the, uh, the forbidden region. So this will be A3 hyperbolic cosine of alpha now. And again, I want to be careful. I'm going, I'm choosing sine, I'm choosing the hyperbolic sine and cosine so that I can attach at the point x equals plus a. So the appropriate choice then is to center it at x equals a. So I do x minus, now it's positive a. And then I also will have another parameter that applies in my region, which is b sub 3, multiplying the hyperbolic sine function, which is the relevant function now. Alpha is the um, exponential constant, and again, this is x minus a. Great, we're almost there. We once again have to attach our second type of boundary conditions. And we are now applying these at the location x equals plus a. And we will again go in order. I will begin with the value boundary condition. So for the value boundary condition, what I'm saying is that phi 3 at location a has to match phi 2 at that same matching location. So once again, what I'm saying is phi 2, which describes the solution in this region, when I evaluate it at this point, x equals a, it has to attach exactly with the same value of what phi 3 gives me at that location, x equals a. And so that I don't have to scroll up and down again, of course, once we work out that condition, I'm going to think about the slope, and I will, will evaluate the slope in region 2, at x equals a and the slope in region 3 at x equals a and I will equate those to make sure I'm satisfying my uh, boundary condition and appropriately attaching to these exponential solutions in locations x greater than a. Great, so we can now uh, look at the math and equate these. When I insert a in for the value of x into phi 3, I will get hyperbolic cosine of 0, which is, has a value of 1, so I will get a3. So this will equal, very analogously to what we had before, this will equal a3 times hyperbolic cosine of 0, but hyperbolic cosine of 0 is just 1. That must match phi 2 evaluated at location A. Here is phi 2 all written down, so I just stick x equals A into this form. And you will notice then that what I get is the sum of these two different terms. I get a d1 times cosine of now k times 2a, because x is set to a. And k times 2a would just give me 2ka. Plus then I get d1 again, but now d1 is multiplied by alpha over k. And now it multiplies sine, sticking in a for x, sine of 2ka. Sine 2ka. Very good. That's the value. Now for the slope. The slope condition is very much the same. I want that phi 3 prime, its derivative at a, has to match the derivative of phi 2 at location x equals a. Now for phi 3, we've written things down so things will be simple. Derivative of hyperbolic cosine is hyperbolic sine, but I'm evaluating at a, so I'll have sine, hyperbolic sine of 0, which gives me back 0, so there's nothing from this first term. For the second term, when I take the derivative with respect to x, I pull out an alpha, so I get alpha b3, so this will equal alpha b3, times then hyperbolic sine, I'm sorry, I'm doing this term, hyperbolic sine turns into hyperbolic cosine evaluated at zero, which we know, as we had just said, gives us one. So this whole right-hand side is just alpha b3. So just like I immediately have access to a3 from this equation, it'll be very easy for me to get b3 by dividing my left-hand side here through by alpha. And then I can construct the full solution. Now, left-hand side, I need the slope of phi 2 evaluated at a. So I need to take the derivative of this term and evaluate x equals a. 
Okay, now I see I scrunched myself down here a little bit, so I'm going to start a little bit further here on the left. So when I take the derivative and evaluate at a, the k comes out, and cosine turns into a minus sign. So I will get minus k. Well, actually, let's keep d1 as an overall outside factor. So I'll have minus d1, the k comes out, and then I have sine of k times 2a, or sine of 2ka. In the second term, when I take the derivative, the k comes out. It kills the k in the denominator. So I get plus d1 alpha. So I'll get a plus d1 alpha. And then the sine turns into cosine, and it's cosine of k times 2a, otherwise known as cosine of 2ka. That equals the derivative that I have to match. Terrific. So now I think we've got everything. We can solve in our heads for a3 and b3 and then write down the final solution for phi3. So therefore, phi3 of x will equal, it's going to be long. I'll see if I can get it all in one line. Probably not. Probably not even a good idea to try. But it's going to be a3 times hyperbolic cosine. Here is a3. So it's all of this stuff times hyperbolic cosine. They, these two, so all of this stuff has two factors of d1. I'm going to pull those out. So there will be a d1. The factor, which is my a3, has then cosine of 2ka plus alpha over k times sine of 2ka. Right? That's this entire A3. And A3 multiplies the hyperbolic cosine part. So hyperbolic cosine alpha of x minus A. That's the first part. The second term, plus, we have a cinch term. So there's going to be plus. Now, it's B3 that multiplies the, the hyperbolic sine. B3 is these terms divided by alpha. Notice, once again, they have this common factor of d1, which I will factor out, d1. I have to divide all of this by alpha, so I get uh, minus, don't forget my minus sign, minus k over alpha times sine of 2ka, which is what I had here. So this is interesting. Notice there's this funny reciprocal relationship here. That's kind of alpha over k, k over alpha, interesting plus d1 has been factored out. The alpha I will be dividing by, so it's just plus cosine of 2ka, plus cosine of 2ka. So it's kind of, you know, symmetric, but a little bit different from the first term. And finally, these pieces are multiplying my hyperbolic sine, so times sine, hyperbolic sine of alpha times x minus a. And so, uh, very beautifully, I have then my uh, third piece of my solution. So I have the full solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So this will then tell me how the function behaves once I've uh, attached slope and value properly into this region. And we know also it will always be curving away from the axis over here. And what we have to remain to see is what's going to happen next. Right? It very well may be that this function um, is always curving away from the axis. It might end up curving too much away from the axis right? and eventually diverging exponentially. That's a possibility. That would be bad. It also uh, could be the case that it actually manages to de be a perfect decaying exponential. That's also always curving away from the axis, but would give me a proper wave function. And it's also possible it might actually curve away from the axis, but actually cross the axis, and then have to curve away from below the axis and blow up at infinity. And these are the three types of possibilities we will consider next time to try to unravel this mystery of why it is that we find discrete energy levels. And we will take that up in our next set of discussions.